onto the white battlefield. Chapter 4 Occasionally the silently falling emblems of winter will be caught in an eddying wind and blown around like bubbles. The imposing castle and all its pillars were caked with white, and their outlines left terribly indistinct. And beyond them lay the silvery world, where the line between heaven and earth was no longer distinguishable. The pair of figures that had appeared without warning was quickly swallowed by the flowing whiteness, yet their colors faintly remained like a watercolor painting. "'Aren't you cold?' asked the giant. Raya was stark naked. "'Well, it's all your fault, you know,' she countered. "'I suppose it is at that. "'This is my domain. "'I'll thank you not to imagine you're at an advantage.' "'I know,' the giant said as he took a quick peek over his shoulder. "'You're thinking about him, aren't you?' said the woman. "'You mean to tell me you're not? "'I'd like to see him once more.' He might not be very personable, but he's a good guy, Dinus remarked. He's a sad man, though. You can say that again. I don't think he'd care to have us empathizing with him. Compared to him, our fate's not that bad. At least this can be concluded. How true. Come to me. But why do we fight? We don't know each other from a hole in the ground. It's a pointless question. You should know that. Raya said, her voice tossed by the wind. You've got a point. The giant said with a nod, and then he swung his club with one hand. We still fight, even though both our masters are now gone. That's a laugh. I hate you. We don't hate each other, we're just hostile. And even that emotion doesn't really belong to us. It seems you've gone soft on me. You'll never be able to beat me like that. And what happens when one of us wins? The wind whistled. There were no words for it to shred. There were only warriors. Raya's body sank a bit. She was empty-handed. Her broom had been lost. Suddenly the ground beneath the giant's feet glowed as electric shocks ran in reverse, and a few streaks of light that challenged the heavens formed a massive cylinder, giving the desolate white world a purplish hue. And in the center of that cylinder was the giant. Even after the light suddenly disappeared, the ruins stood out sharply from the white of the snow for some time to come. Not too shabby. And the giant said as he clapped at all the smoking sections of his body with both hands. This certainly is your domain, all right, but I still have a few tricks of my own. He brought his right hand up to his mouth, and his thick lips disgorged a shining ball. As he grabbed it and hurled it into the air, the winter was greeted by a miniature sun. Apparently the feverish globe was emitting a tremendous heat of its own, and wrapped Around it was a fiery corona exactly like that of the real sun. It instantly reached a temperature of a hundred million degrees. Even the constituent atoms of the very ground were scorched, reduced to nothingness. And of that inferno, a naked figure flew at the giant's chest. He was sent flying thirty feet, his arms still raised in a hasty block. As he rolled on the ground, snow caked around his body like a belt, and the belt was tinged with red. Quickly rising again, the giant clutched the right side of his chest and spat up bright blood. You're one hell of a woman, you know. If I didn't have this armor, I'd have been a goner. And if this barrier wasn't still active, I'd have been reduced to ashes. Raya replied coldly. Interesting. We're finally getting down to business. And the giant held his log club at the ready. When Raya's body gently tilted forward, the weapon sailed through the air, forcing her lithe form to jump back. What the hell? Dinus groaned, knitting his brow. He'd noticed the change that had come over Raya. Not again, he shouted as he raced toward her. As he came alongside her, his legs grew wobbly. 
That kick of yours sure knocked me for a loop, he said. Even as Dinus fell on top of the girl, he used both arms to support his weight and avoid a direct hit before rolling off to one side. Several seconds later, a shadowy figure appeared beside the two prone forms. You're both unbelievably strong, spat the man who'd once identified himself as Duran, his face as emotionless as a no mask. This big bastard and D are so intense, we couldn't very easily make a move, but it looks like our time has finally come. Now put an end to this battle that's been going on for 10,000 years. Oh, but it's been so long. As exhaustion seemed to spread through his whole body, the man in farm attire knelt down by the giant's side, thrusting both hands. A picture of Dinus, sitting by a campfire. Out before him, he began to move them as if he were tracing something in the air, and then after mere seconds, an indistinct blue shape formed in the space that had clearly been vacant before. As he moved his hands with complete focus, Duran wore the expression of a flagellant. In no time at all, the semi-transparent form he was manipulating became that of the giant lying beside him, Dinos. Duran stood up. As he did so, his hands also rose, and the other Dinos rose with them. And then the huge effigy through which the falling snow could still be glimpsed was positioned right on top of the real giant. Duran tumbled back on his ass, thoroughly winded. His face was pale. Taking a half dozen deep breaths, he then moved on to the next bizarre act. He placed his hands to either side of his head. Snow danced around. Overlapping like a double exposure, the twin forms of Dinus began to mysteriously lose their color from the top of their heads. Not only the duplicate, but the body beneath it as well. Impressive as Dinus was, it didn't seem likely that the warrior would be able to continue the fight once his head had been erased. But given Durin's sorcerer's might, it was likely he'd wipe the man's whole body out of existence. However, before the fearful sorcerer could claim the victory that lay right before him, he had to turn. Though the figure was blurred by the wide, the crazily gusting snow did nothing to detract from its beauty. D. So he decided to come after all. Durin muttered in a faraway tone as he stood up. That being the case, Crumb must have been slain. I shall have to avenge him. I have no intention of getting involved in your battle. D said softly. Too late. Having killed one of my colleagues, you're now part of this. Duran informed him in a wary sounding voice. He was aware that when D's presence had interrupted his concentration, Dinus' head had returned to normal. And both of his hands rose. Putting Serna up on his shoulder, Dinus swiftly strode back to the far side of the chamber, where D was waiting. He was surrounded by bizarre equipment, as was Raya. From the colossal cylinders that looked like they might go up the whole seventy feet, right down to little bits no bigger than a fingernail, everything was clearly part of a highly complex machine. More to the center of the device than D, Ray lay on what appeared to be an operating table, although it was unclear whether it was made of metal or some organic substance. It was obvious that the table played an important role in the mechanism from the way a blue light radiated from deep within it. Well. Serna gave a nod of affirmation in reply to Dee's query. This was definitely the chamber used for programming the Super Warrior. Do you know how to operate it? It took the linguist ten seconds to look all around and tilt his head to one side. More or less, said Serna. However, I can't be sure if I'm correct or not. After all, this machine belonged to the nobility. At any rate, let's give it a try. Start telling us what to do. Dee said ignoring the mechanical uncertainties of the linguist. Serna began inspecting the equipment. Fortunately, there were no major differences between this and the plans discovered in the ruins of the moving continent. In particular, 
He was relieved to discover the check sensors that allowed someone to tell at a glance how well the entire machine was functioning were exactly the same. When the snow was about to turn all of them into white sculptures, Serna gave the thumbs up. This is a spectacular piece of equipment. There isn't a single thing wrong with it. Every single piece of machinery is operational now, and will probably still be so ten millennia from now. I couldn't care less about that, just get started already. Dinah said as he had sailed on Rhea to blow the snow off of her. Understood. In principle, this is how it should go. I'll erase the warrior DNA that's been sleeping all along in Rhea's genes. This will involve using the machine that awakened her the first time she came here to completely reverse the process. Serna walked off about six feet to the right to a piece of equipment that appeared to be a computer. The data that was used to awaken the warrior memories in Ms. Raya has been input into this machine. I'll instruct it to immediately erase the same. That'd be wonderful, we're counting on you, said the giant. Hold everything, Brewer interjected through chattering teeth. There's not any chance of you screwing things up and killing her or anything, is there? Because warrior or not, I'll have you know I still have $6,000 invested in her. You won't be complaining much after you freeze to death. The giant then trained an intense gaze on Serna as he said, Let's get started. Serna nodded. His hand reached out for a protrusion on the computer, but there was a second's pause before he actually touched it. During that time, the stranger's thoughts occupied his mind. Should I be doing this? Should I turn her back into a normal human being? A dark murmur asked. It was the linguist's own ambition-choked voice. I'll never happen across another specimen like this again, a warrior spawned by the nobility, a being to rival the incredible concentration of energy that dwelt so long in that other castle. Can I allow myself to simply put something like that back to sleep? Serna threw the switch. There was no change in the world. No lighter sound was created. But both Rhea's eyes snapped open at that instant. Something's wrong. Dinah shouted. It was a second later that Serna's right arm was taken off at the shoulder by a flash of white light. D, don't get involved anymore. Dinah said brightly. I've had fun here the last few days. I'll never have it that good again, I suppose. Exactly, said Raya. As she quickly sat up on the operating table, her whole body was painted white by a horizontal gust of snow. Don't forget me either. Goodbye, Dee. As the girl got off the table, the giant crouched down and braced himself. Hey. Stop it. You two don't seriously intend to fight, do you? The two figures streaked up over Brewer's head. What in the world? As the flesh trader stood there with eyes bulging, the man in black raced past him saying, Take care of him. The voice came from over by the same rope Brewer had climbed down. When he looked in that direction, Brewer's eyes reflected only a figure in black going up the rope with the speed of a swallow in flight. Giving his head a shake to clear it, he then dashed over to the groaning and blood-spattered linguist. Up on the ground where everything was hidden by white, Dee looked up to the heavens. Somewhere in the leaden clouds beyond his vision, a gruesome battle to the death was surely taking place. In the black center of his pupils, a white globe burnt its image. It swelled to include all of the colors of the rainbow, covering first the entirety of his eyes, and then dominating a whole section of the sky. It's over, isn't it? said a wary voice from the left hand of the long shadow that fell on the ground. The angry howls of a new wind buffeted the earth. The snow had stopped. A short while after that, white steam enveloped the world. And deep. The endless dance of the white flurry had suddenly become a downpour of warm water. And Dee alone saw the pair of black specks that fell in the distant wilderness. With a low whistle, the hunter summoned his cyborg steed. 
The hot rain mercilessly pelted a burnt and twisted object that barely retained any resemblance to a human form. Getting off his horse, Dee went over to Raya. Perhaps sensing his presence, the girl opened her eyes a crack. They weren't the eyes of a warrior. This time, I remember. Ray exhaled in a faint breath. Never wanted to do that, Dee. What in the world was I, after all? A farmer's daughter. Really? The girl said, and she seemed to smile. I wish we'd made more time together. I wanted to stay with the two of you forever. All the strength drained from Rhea's body. As she passed on, the giant lying beside her muttered in a low voice, Yes. I'll be cashing out shortly myself, but it felt good to be able to fight with everything I had. What'd she say anyway? Apparently he hadn't heard her. She'll be waiting for you, Dee said. Is that a fact? I wonder if I'll be able to tend fields on the other side, too. On second thought, scratch that. I'm sure she'll be waiting for me with armor on. As he looked at Dee, his bloody lips formed a smile. Heaven speed, Dee. The three of us will meet again. A minor spasm ran through his body, and then a gigantic form returned to the earth. Something pale began dancing through the air again. Dee looked at the ruins. Hate-filled dreams that lived on for ten thousand years were now shrouded in white. Pitchbrick. The linguist's wound was no longer bleeding a few hours later, when the flesh trader reached ground level with the younger man over his shoulder. And what they saw there were two mounds beneath the white mantle, and one of them had a charred log planted behind it. Returning to the road, the flesh trader ran his gaze down it. And beyond the wildly gusting snow, he got the feeling that he caught a momentary glimpse of a hazy figure in a black coat. And then everything was swallowed by an endless dance of purest white. Chapter 4 End Vampire Hunter D. Dark Nocturne Written by Hideyuki Kikuchi. End.